Uh, let me introduce uh, and then welcome to the podium each of our panelists in succession. First, uh, Grant Aldonis, who's Principal Managing Director of Split Rock International, a business and public policy consulting firm. Uh, prior to joining Split Rock, Mr. Aldonis served as Under Secretary of Commerce for International Trade under President George W. Bush, uh, an extraordinarily experienced trade negotiator in the US. It's fantastic to have you here, Grant. Joining him on the stage, somebody that I, I think for today's purposes we're going to call an Australian, Andrew Stoller, despite his accent. Um, Andrew, of course, founded the, the Centre on International Trade at the University of Adelaide about 10 years ago. Andrew has led the trade and investment strand of the Alliance 21 project from its inception. And of course, he was a Deputy Director General of the WTO during the Clinton administration. And of course, I have to say, I don't know what kind of hat I'm wearing today. I still have my confused accent. Uh, I think I took leave from my current job yesterday. I don't start my new job in the United States until the 1st of July, so I don't know what country I'm representing either here, but I'm looking forward to our conversation. So please join me in welcoming our panelists to the stage. And as I move over, um, obviously we should begin by acknowledging uh, as the USTR did, that the Australia-US Free Trade Agreement has been extraordinarily successful in gross numbers. As the Ambassador said, uh, US-Australia trade has more than doubled in the decade since the agreement was signed. Some people in Australia remain concerned about the deal because the trade imbalance, the trade deficit that Australia runs with the US has not significantly reduced over that period. But I think the, the part of the story that certainly Andrew Robb would highlight and Kim Beasley has for a long time as well is that investment, two-way investment between Australia and the US has, has absolutely taken off in that 10-year period. And I, and I think that the free trade agreement uh, was an important element in that. Uh, I know that uh, Ms. Minister Robb was in the US uh, with the Prime Minister only a couple of weeks ago uh, not only talking up investment opportunities in Australia in the raw materials sector from mining to agriculture, but also reminding Americans about the, just the incredible power of Australian superannuation funds uh, looking for global investment opportunities, and certainly the opportunities in the US, US are excellent. So US-Australia relations in trade and investment have been going gangbusters. It's also true that both countries have had real successes in the free trade agreement world in the last little while. President Obama signed uh, a, an agreement with the Republic of Korea, I think in 2011. That was a very important deal and obviously a hard one to do because of sensitivities on agriculture and on automobiles in the US. And obviously the Abbott government has really pushed very hard in its first nine months on free trade agreements in Asia with the big three, Korea, Japan, and as the minister said, he hopes China uh, in the bilateral free trade agreement tent with Australia. However, having said all of that, and let me turn to our panelists, there is an elephant in the room. Uh, and the elephant, of course, is China. And I thought it was, it was quite striking, maybe I can start with you, Grant. It was quite striking uh, in uh, Ambassador Froman's remarks that he said that TPP wasn't only about trade, it was about values. And he also used a term that President Obama famously used when he addressed the Australian Parliament nearly three years ago, the rules of the road. As you know, there's a lot of concern about uh, TPP in China. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, uh, there's a view that says from an economic standpoint, boy, this makes no sense. We've got an Asia-Pacific free trade agreement um, for the 21st century that doesn't include the world's largest trader and I would imagine the largest, largest trading partner of a majority of TPP members. On the other hand, we have people, including Henry Kissinger, arguing that this is a, this is a, a quasi-containment move or potentially could be perceived as a, and has been perceived as a quasi-containment move um, by the US against China, and, in, and particularly with the inclusion of Japan 
a notoriously difficult trade partner in TPP negotiations at a time when China-Japan relations were at a, a, at a long-term low. So there's a, there is a view out there that says, uh, on the one hand, boy, how can you have free trade without China? On the other hand, is this another arm in the geopolitical uh, tensions between China and the US? The US responds, however, and says, we're very open to having China in TPP, just right, not right now, because we want to conclude the deal first. That's what happened in WTO when Andrew was, uh, was back in the WTO negotiations 20 years ago. But I was just in Beijing. I got off a plane from Beijing uh, on Sunday night. And the Chinese say, we've grown up a long way from 20 years ago. This is really a slap in the face for us to be excluded from these negotiations. What's your take on the US's thinking about China trade investment? First and most important thing is to realize that the agreement in setting the rules for uh, what is much of the rest of Asia still grapples with the sorts of things we have to do with the predominant forces that form the regional and global value chains that serve global consumer markets. China's role has traditionally been the tail end of that process. And so the idea that you would deny the opportunity to try and set the rules of the road and reinforce the dynamism in the rest of the region when China has not expressed an interest actually in saying we definitely want to sit down and participate. It seems to me that it's going a little too far to say that's a slap in their face. The reality is we started the negotiation. We will include an accession clause in the agreement at the end of the day. And when China feels prepared that it wants to sit down and have that conversation, everybody will be open to it, because it has to come at some point. So you, you, you're envisaging a, a WTO-like replay in which a, a basic framework with accession clauses will be delivered. Of course, the... the uh, I, mean, I, should, I should say, Jeff, too, that the sophisticated end of it would be to get the rules right on things like state-owned enterprises, intellectual property, so that essentially what you're reaching at is to the that part of the princeling generation that's interested in economic reform, that sees a value in economic reform, that sees the road it has to go down in China and creating an opportunity for them to join. I think that's absolutely right. And, and it, in that regard, it was quite striking to me that, again, in quite a short address, Ambassador Froman mentioned the three big issues where China is concerned. State-owned mm -hmm. enterprises, intellectual property, and market access. Absolutely. Given the fact that things are gummed up in US politics today, why wouldn't you use this as an opportunity to start talking more actively with the Chinese about TPP? Um, I guess I don't see the direct connection there, Jeff. You know, the, the reason things are gummed up uh, in US politics doesn't actually relate to China. No, absolutely, yeah. but isn't it an opportunity? The, the US said, certainly in the last two years, it said, we've got to get an agreement, we've got to get an agreement, we've got to get an agreement. Uh, but even, a, in, even Andrew Robb just said, listen, there's not going to be a TPP agreement this year, and he hopes to get one before the presidential election. Isn't that enough time? So let me, let me, let me describe the circumstance, and then I think it will help answer the question. If you're facing a circumstance, as the president is at this point, where three-quarters of the House Democrats have written you a letter and says that they are opposed to TPP and to a grant of negotiating authority that would allow you to conclude that agreement, some large share of which is because of Vietnam. And then if you said, I'm not sure the president's actually willing to go to bat to take on his own party even for this agreement. That's an open question mm -hmm. right now in our political environment. The idea that you would then take that rather fraught circumstance and say, now what we're going to do is we're going to negotiate with China strikes me just as a bridge too far. So I think it's wise at this point, as long as China hasn't asked not to make the offer, but it's also important to leave open the opportunity not to say that somehow this is an attempt to circle the wagons in some respect, because it's not that. And I have to say, when I think about the broader changes in uh, the trading system and the broader changes actually in things that are more in your world, Jeff, in terms of industrial organization and the softening of the boundaries of firms and what that implies about the changing pattern of trade and the way that trade policy aims have to come to grips with that, it's an easier crucible to deal with this front end of the value chains in terms of trying to write those rules before we sit down and have that conversation. Yeah, I think, I think that's a very important point. And, and obviously, we should go through the business and economics of TPP in some detail. 
Um, but Andrew, uh, Robert Hill, who's a consummate diplomat, asked uh, Andrew Robb whether there was any tension between bilaterals and multilaterals. And uh, Andrew Robb, a very good politician, responded with the old line that, um, that bilaterals are building blocks, not stumbling blocks to multilaterals. But Australia is negotiating a bilateral deal with its largest trading partner, China. Is there no contradiction for Australia today between that and supporting a TPP that doesn't include China? What's your take on this issue? Well, I thought, <coughs> excuse me, I thought the minister handled that answer very well when he said that these things were really progressive building blocks. You know, if you, if you can get Japan and Korea to agree to something in a bilateral agreement, uh, then already there's a sign that if you move that then into the TPP after they've had a little bit of a time for structural adjustment or to think about how they're going to handle their domestic lobbies, it becomes easier then to deal with that in the TPP context. And I, and I would argue that eventually, once they've agreed to it in the TPP, someday we can hope maybe to go back to Geneva and have it agreed at a broader multilateral level. So I think it really is a step-by-step -step process where it's a lot easier to get used to the increased competition if you do it a little bit at a time. Now, you know, just to go back to the question that you asked uh, <clears throat> Grant a minute ago about uh, China, I have to say I've, I've wrestled with this question a lot myself because I, I don't see it as a slap in the face to ask the Chinese to come along later on. And in fact, there will be a, a whole number of other countries that we would expect to eventually see in the TPP which will have to go that accession route if the TPP is concluded with the current membership. I mean, the Koreans, for example, have been told to wait until after the deal is done, and then they'll have to go through the same sort of process as the Chinese, in part because I think uh, there's this concern about polluting the the creation of the new rules of the game too much by having but do the you Chinese really in. believe uh, I'm going to have to interrupt you there. Do yeah. you really believe that an agreement that's got Japan in it will be a high-quality 21st century trade agreement. I think, the, I think the concerns, for those who were concerned that TPP was more about geopolitics than economics, the biggest piece of evidence they've got was an agreement with Japan, a notorious free trade re recalcitrant, at a time when, when Japan-China relationships were deteriorating significantly. So do you still think that TPP will be, quote unquote, a 21st century agreement, and what, what would that entail? What would distinguish it, let's say, from a WTO-style deal? Well, again, Grant uh, hinted at that in one of the answers that he gave you earlier. I mean, first of all, to be a 21st century agreement, and to be an agreement of the type that Ambassador Froman and others have talked about, this is an agreement which is much more about rules than it is about market access. There are some market access elements, even in the United States, things like sugar. There's the rice problem in Japan. There are a few things along the, along the margins there to deal with market access, the old-style protectionist issues. But what this is really much more about are the things that Ambassador Froman referred to. They're setting the rules for the 21st century trading regime. And the window of opportunity for countries like Australia and the United States and the European Union and others to do that now is kind of limited because if they don't do it soon, we're going to have more and more pressure from BRICS for other types of uh, trading arrangements. Now, Ambassador Froman talked about state and enterprises, but he also talked about transparency and consistency of regulation. He talked about uh, the need to have a more open uh, trading environment in respect of the internet and transborder data flows, the type of you know cloud computing issues that we have today, and all these things have got to be fixed, I think, early on. <clears throat> and what makes the TPP so significant, what makes the other mega regional between the US and the EC so significant is that the reason we're doing it and the reason and what makes it so different from the WTO is it's all locked into the fact that today most of the world trade is conducted on these global value chains. And where do global value chains locate? They locate in investment-friendly economies that have low transaction costs and where the, where the rules of the game are predictable. And if you can't find a location that meets those criteria that we're trying to help set with something like the TPP, then you're out of the GVC game. 
And nothing in the WTO negotiation, by the way, is going to help you on those GVCs. Of course, uh, China for a long time has been the largest supplier in the global supply chain and is now the largest market for a lot of American multinational firms. Um, although, Grant, although in fairness, Jeff, you know, when you think about it, this is the point where if I was talking just to a U.S. audience, I'd pull out my iPhone and go through all those great things by Tim Sturgeon of separating out the values mm -hmm. actually created. Just to point out that China's role in that process is one that is only now emerging from being that last 5%, the part that was assembling everything else. And so, you know, you're really in a situation where what's unfolding in this agreement offers an opportunity to write a set of rules where Japan, interestingly enough, when I talk with their negotiators, and this surprises me too, Jeff, is actually may have more negotiating flexibility than Mike Cronin because of obvious support, because of the win in the upper house and the divergent politics, let me put it politely, in the United States. And so I appreciate the, the architecture you're describing, the visual you're describing, why it may look that way, particularly if you're in Beijing. Having said that, what I actually see among the negotiators is there may actually be more political room and more of an intent on the part of the Japanese. Here's one of those other... Uh, gorillas in the room, part of the problem the Japanese are facing is an unwillingness, given the negotiations they've already had on autos and a few other products, where they had to first negotiate with USTR and then have to renegotiate with people on the Hill, they're unwilling at this point to put their best and final offer on the table because there's no fast-track negotiating authority. And so these issues of politics get all gummed up together at this point, and I think the process and the Japanese, even with their flexibility, are waiting for some reassurance that there's this deep commitment to drive things through, that the votes will be there, that everybody's counted the noses in Washington, uh, and that the, it will be able to unfold. And at that point, I expect that they'll be able to go much further than what we're hearing about right now. I don't think that'll necessarily be calm the nerves of people in China who would prefer to see this as something which is uh, a containment move or, you know, Henry's views. But the reality of it is, is that there's an economic logic to this which I fully embrace. And certainly between the United States and Australia, in terms of what we now see is the need not just to do the individual uh, tariff, but actually to create a frictionless enabling environment that allows particularly our smaller firms to engage through larger firms into the global economy. This is the most dynamic negotiation we have that's moving in that direction. So while I often puckishly say, there's no virtue to a 21st century agreement. We're already in the 21st century, right? It's not actually you know, something that would uh, make you feel like it's bold. But the reality is we're behind the 21st century in the way we're approaching most of our trade negotiations. And this happens to be the best opportunity to make that leap forward. I think that, that's exactly right. And let me just reassure you and everyone else. There is no view from Beijing. I was sitting in the Park Hyatt the other day and you could only see about 300 yards in front of you. So, <laughs> so a view to the TPP was, was not really on the table, although I did see, I, I, I could almost envisage the Great Wall in the distance mm. at some point. Um, so, so let's now pivot. I, I think you've both emphasised uh, that that trade agreements now just look differently than the way they did even 15 years ago. So for everyone who's not following this so closely, and Robert, this, maybe this was behind Robert's question, one of the reasons that, that a deal like TPP is important is because it's not about lowering tariffs. We've already lowered tariffs. Mo most of the TPP countries have strong bilateral deals with low tariffs. We're talking about behind the border regulatory kind of environment. We're talking about multinational firms. We're talking about supply chains. One issue that has been very sensitive in Australia, Australia and the US obviously are in lockstep on lots of trade issues, including in TPP. One issue where there, has, there was under the previous Labor government certainly real disagreement was the so-called ISDS, uh, Investor State Dispute Settlement. Um, who would like to explain in non-trade jargony terms, which of you would like to explain what the issue is here? And then the follow-up would be, uh, why is the US so in favour of this and why is the US, why is Australia been so reticent? Andrew, you want to give it a well, shot? Let me give it a shot because uh, a couple of years ago I had the misfortune to be associated with the Productivity Commission on a study of bilateral regional trade agreements and this issue came up there. And uh, the issue really relates to something that you typically find in an investment agreement, which looks very innocent. 
It's a phrase called fair and equitable treatment. Now, fair and equitable treatment sounds like motherhood and apple pie, but what that actually means, if you have that in an investment agreement, is that you are not real, if you are the government, host government, you are not really free to change the conditions of competition that existed at the time the investment was made. And probably the most famous case here in Australia is the plain packaging for cigarettes, where the companies would argue, look, at the time I made that investment, I could put Marlboro on the package, now I can't do it anymore, and you've deprived me of an important part of my investment, so I'm going to sue you. Typically in a free trade agreement, or typically in a trade agreement, it's a government-to-government -government agreement, but in, in many investment chapters of free trade agreements, we have investor state dispute settlement, which means that if the, the government of the investor country doesn't want to take the issue up on a government-to-government -government basis, and they probably wouldn't on a case like that, then the investor has the right to take the case to uh, dispute settlement, and typically that happens at the World Bank. There's an international center for settlement of investment disputes. Now, Australia, the Australian government, the previous Australian government, uh, particularly in light of the plain packaging case, because they were sued on that issue, said that uh, they didn't want to have this question um, create regulatory chill in Australia. In other words, they didn't want to be afraid to do things because they would get sued. So the best way to do that would be to stay away from it. Now, I think, if I'm well informed, that Australia has found a way around this in the Korean agreement, because I think there's ISDS in the Korean agreement, and where Australia, the two sides have agreed to carve certain things out. So the way to protect yourself against the repeat of the plain packaging thing is to just say, all right, we're going to have investor state dispute settlement, but it won't cover A, B, and C. You can't take these issues up, like a health issue or something like that. So I'm, I'm hoping that this has been diffused and that we'll find a way through in the TPP because the majority of TPP members do want to have ISDS in the agreement in order to make it meaningful. Sorry to go on for so, but, the, but let, let's let's do that, that. That's very helpful, Andrew. And and let me just underscore the key issue, which is an old political science concern. It's multi. The the critics on the left say that multinational firms want to undercut national sovereignty, and in this case, they're saying to governments you must waive your right to change public policy for reasons you see fit because we did, a, we did a deal with your predecessor, or in fact, you just changed your mind. Why? This is quite interesting to me, Grant. If you compare uh, TPP with WTO negotiations, multinational firms were quite visible, certainly in the US, in a pro-WTO sense. Uh, in TPP, they've been much less visible, probably because it's been post-2008. But is this a critical issue for the US, or is it, is it a critical issue for the US government, or is it the key issue for American multinational firms? It's, it's a critical issue for American firms as well as for the government. Um, now, I'll also say, though, that, and this is, goes back to the logic of collective action, Jeff, which is that global companies um, are still more interested in a tangible tariff reduction. They sort of feel like these rules are good government and they shouldn't have to pay for that. They shouldn't have to lobby for it, right? So the irony is, is that you don't get as much pressure from the business community for an agreement that is actually about rules, which is you but rightly that, point that was out. certainly the case. That was the criticism about the Doha round because it was quote unquote a development round. But now we're talking about a more bread and butter area for multinational firms, as you said, the global supply chain, or at least the Asia Pacific supply chain, aren't the issues, that are, isn't there real money at stake now for firms? Well, the way I would look at it is that if, if Australia decides that it wants to create greater uncertainty about investment, capital is sufficiently mobile, as you know better than anyone else, that, and capital's a coward, it will find some other place to go. And so whether you invest uh, the energy and the effort, given all the issues you have in front of your own government or the Australian government, to fight on this particular issue in a context where they perceive that's just a set of rules that Australia should have, I'd be very surprised that you feel quite the same push you would say if you're talking about getting a 10% tariff down and that meant something to Dow Chemical, right? So the irony is, is that you're going to have a little bit less pressure uh, I think from the point of view of the politics of it, it's much easier for uh, Ambassador Froman to give away uh, because of constituencies in the United States that are also opposed to ISDS. 
And so it's a very delicate time. I look at it more from Australia's perspective, and I look at it more from somebody who spent most of his life in the private sector, despite the sort of list of jabs, and being an international lawyer. You know, it really boils down to one thing. Can the government take your property without compensation? There's no necessary regulatory chill. The question is whether you took someone's property and whether you'll compensate them for it. And so ultimately, it makes sense if Australia is interested in bringing investment to its shores to make sure that it has done as much to reassure capital that this is a place where your, your property rights are going to be protected. Yeah, it's, it's very yeah. interesting. and it, It's really shades of all that discussion about sort of imperialism by multinational firms in the 1970s. It has shades of old socialism, no, doesn't I mean, it? That the government's going to come and appropriate all your assets. No, Jeff, I was chuckling about it because what was ringing in the back of my mind was Noam Chomsky when you were talking yeah, about yeah. that. You know, yeah, to, yeah. To, to him... He's an it, expert on everything, of course. Of he course. might be a good linguist, but, he's, <laughs> but he thinks him, he knows the, a lot about global politics. There's nothing that isn't part of... I forget yeah. what he calls it, the, uh, uh, the neoliberal project, yeah. right? Uh, where everything is driven by profit maximization. And it really does miss the idea that rules are critically important, particularly to the people at the bottom of society and to the weakest members in a trading system. And it denies the reality of what those rules can mean at the end of the day and what it can encourage. Yeah, and certainly, do. I mean, what everyone, what everyone says, and it, and it should be repeated over and over again, is that I think if you look at Chinese poverty alleviation, a freeing up of trade and Chinese accession to WTO is absolutely critical. So we, we should always remember that. It's not the World Bank, it's the private sector, really, that, that have made that possible. Um, one thing, Andrew, if I could pivot to you now, a difficult Australian question. Again, I'm not surprised that uh, Ambassador Froman didn't mention, um, and you're both too polite to mention, so I've got to do it. Um, uh, Australia's open for business, but uh, Australia didn't allow Archer Daniels Midland to buy a very struggling Australian grain distributor, Grain Corp. Uh, how, how, how significant an issue is that for the US and China, or uh, US and Australia? Have both sides just sort of moved on from it? How do you understand, Andrew, what happened there, and, and whether it was just a, a, a necessary bump in the political road, or whether there was something more serious at play? Uh, well, first of all, I would just observe that uh, the minister noted that he was the first Australian trade and investment minister. Mm -hmm. And I think what you can tell from the discussion we're having is just how interrelated trade and investment are and how much sense it makes to have them dealt with like that because these these trade deals are as, as much about investment as they are about anything else. So just, just an observation there. On the Archer Daniel Midland thing, uh, I mean, my understanding of, I, don't, I think it's a bump in the road. I don't think you're going to see another repeat of a big turndown like that anytime soon. I think there were a lot of sensitivities here in Australia over whether or not uh, ADM um, would uh, treat them with the same sensitivity that an Australian-owned operation might. And, you know, I hope I don't get sued for saying this, but uh, ADM has had a few shady things in its past in terms of how they've done business. And that truth, might... The truth is a complete defense. Yes, yeah, so that's right. So, so you agree that that's true? Yeah, definitely. All right. <laughs> <coughs> so you have that, a lot, lot, long enough past and a large enough footprint, and it's pretty likely that... Uh, yeah, that and, I think, and, I, and I think yeah. people who were aware of some of that history might also have been arguing strongly against the deal on... Or took advantage those of that history. Or to take advantage of it, whatever. Yeah. But I don't think it's. I don't think we're going to see the Australian government uh, willy-nilly turning down big investment proposals in the future. I think there were some special circumstances about that. Well, so the, the interesting thing, Grant, and again from a private investor standpoint, uh, um, you've no doubt been thinking about it a lot. Um, you know, we, we've had these unprecedented uh, foreign investments in, in Australia by, by American energy companies, right. most importantly, led by Chevron, of course. Right. Um, we've also had large cost, cost blowouts and a, certainly an observation uh, in, the, in the business press about regulatory uncertainty mm -hmm. in Australia. Uh, do you think in the, in the modern world it's best to deal with that stuff bilaterally or, or do we really need a uh, regional uh, come global agreement? Well, you know, one of the interesting things about a regional arrangement, which the, the minister didn't, didn't really discuss, is that there's a tendency, and this is why you need that as well as the, the building blocks, as it were, 
there's a tendency for an upward harmonization in standards, both in private sector players in those markets, as well as among the governments. Governments learn from each other as well. And this is one of those areas where in grappling with these sorts of things, I think governments do learn from each other as an advantage in having that sort of arrangement laid out there. And so there's a, a real value from the point of view investors to see these rules in place and have some assurance about what the rules of the road are going to be, not just in the United States and Australia, but elsewhere within the region. So that the, you know, given that we're talking about an economy organized around value chains, they can move the capital where it needs to go to its most efficient use. So I see these things as very sympathetic to what investors are looking for in the way of regulatory reassurance. Now, the reality is most of that assurance is what you do unilaterally. And I was talking with Doug Poe and with Andy earlier that one of the ironies that we're facing is a world where um, globalization has erased the distinction between international economic policy and domestic economic policy. And that much of what we think about our trade policy, if you think about access to capital, access to talent, access to ideas driving whether firms succeed, and much more of the competition being about the ability to communicate, collaborate, and innovate rather than price, well, suddenly you're looking at a situation where immigration policy is a part of your trade policy, your corporate income tax is a part of your trade policy, your approach to regulation is a part of it. So a lot of this stuff should be done unilaterally. The value of the agreement is it allows you to cement good government into place and transparency into place in that process. So really it's an instance, even for the first time in the United States, where I think we have to be looking at whether these rules are things that will actually help us provide that kind of reassurance as well. Okay, so there. Uh, Sorry, that was long with No, no, that's a, very good, that's a very good answer. I only want to raise one more uh, issue with the panel and then uh, leave some room for, for questions from the audience for our panelists. Um, I'll see your multinational firms and I'll raise you an Uber. <laughs> so we've got this uh, Uber. I think Uber was bought by Google for $300 million. It was valued at $18 billion just the other day in a, in a, in a small uh, placement. Mm -hmm. uh, we have taxi drivers around the world protesting against Uber. But of course, there's no Uber headquarters to protest against. No one knows where Uber is. The Uber owners are sitting on a beach somewhere clipping the ticket at 20% on every time an Uber transaction takes place. Is it possible, and we've had obviously other issues about taxation of Google and the like, mm -hmm. is it possible for the regulatory environment to deal with global e-commerce, which is not now multinational, it's a-national? Andrew, I don't know whether you've been thinking about this issue. Obviously, it's been, the Google one's been a big deal in Australia where everyone is, is very happy to say that these e-firms are everywhere and nowhere, so no one can tax them. What, what do you think? Is there a regulatory answer here? Well, you know, if you, you, you can even go all the way back to the Australia and US FTA um, <clears throat> negotiation 10 years ago and find the beginnings of an effort to try to deal with this. In the competition policy chapter, there are also some consumer protection provisions, and the consumer protection provisions allow the Australian competition authorities to raise concerns with the U.S. competition authorities if they think people are being cheated electronically over the Internet and things like that. So it's, a, it's at least an initial step to try to get at that. Uh, I think probably, you know, the fact that Ambassador Froman referred to specifically to e-commerce and Internet and data flows is an indication that uh, the TPP will probably try to go further on these questions. I mean, we all have to recognize that uh, the sort of situation you talk about is increasingly going to be characteristic of doing business. So some effort has to be made to try to, to, to cover it. I think it's probably going to be hard. Uh, for example, there are some sensitivities, I know, between the United States and Australia on the question of transborder data flows and what sort of information gets to go onto the cloud and what doesn't get to go on the cloud. So those will be issues that have to be tackled, but you know, with the best uh, goodwill, hopefully people will be able to get to them at some stage. But, but uh, goodwill only takes you so far. So let me ask you, Grant, uh, in this Uber case, I don't know whether you've mm -hmm. been following it, but it, it just um, it strikes me as uh, about as far as we've gone thus far. So taxi drivers, uh, taxi, uh, taxi monopolies are being disrupted all around the world right. by a company that's no more than an app, mm -hmm. which is only connecting people who want to be taken somewhere with people who can do it. 
as far as I can tell, the only regulatory lever available to any government is are the drivers well enough trained and are the cars sufficiently roadworthy? That strikes me as a remarkably weak response when what you're really saying is we can no longer, no longer control the hire car and taxi fleet in, in a city or a jurisdiction. How, how do you think the regulatory, regulatory regime can well, I guess take it, and, and, and at what level? Does it happen nationally? Does it happen bilaterally, regionally? What's your instinct? It's, it's a very rich question, Jeff. I, I, I have to I'll betray my instincts, which is I would prefer to live in a world where that's the only regulation the government imposed, so that more innovation could take place, particularly in these areas like services, and particularly because of who benefits as the individual entrepreneur who's a part of the Uber link in some respects. It also takes out of the hands of the local government the ability to sell the medallion and the corruption that inherently that encourages in the process. And so I'd prefer to see that arrangement. And I'd prefer to see a set of rules that encourage that arrangement. Now, having said that, the way to look at this is if you think about the problem that each city is having regulating Uber and is trying to grasp that, what you're really seeing is a microcosm of countries inside a global trading system, whether it's the issue of Apple and taxation and the double Dutch sandwich and all the other things they do to move their profits. What you really have to come to grips with is the fact that the things that have happened in the organization of production and the softness, again, of the boundaries of firms has caught up with governance. And that governance has to find a more meaningful response. And my own sense is, is that that is going to have to be done together through negotiations like the TPP. It's going to have to be done to come to grips with these things that have flowed past the boundaries that one regulator can touch. And you're going to have to find a way that you induce a broader arrangement. And then I don't even think, honestly, the TPP goes far enough. That's why I make the joke about the 21st arrangement, it re 21st century arrangement. It really would have to go further. And then you really get into decisions about what values you want to project. What free market mechanisms do you truly want? How much really regulatory power do you reserve for the state at that point? And we're nowhere near ready to deal with that political discussion in the context of the DPP. Okay, th thanks very much. Um, I think we started, uh, we started this session maybe five minutes after the appointed time. I'll look to Robert or Melissa or somebody else with much more power than I have how long we should go in questions. I hope we've put some juicy stuff on the agenda. Would, would anyone like to ask either of our panelists uh, a question or, or make an observation about this discussion? Or heckle. It's, <laughs> or heckle, we can do that. Dick Wolcott would like to say something. Uh, thanks, Jeff. There's been a lot of discussion about the TPP. I'd just like to go back to that for a minute. Uh, it's not just a question of China. What are the positions of, uh, in relation to India, South Korea, and Indonesia? Now, Indonesia, I understand, has had a lot of pressure put on it to come to the party, but I understand it hasn't, and I'm not sure about the position of India or South Korea, but these are three very major economies in addition to China. Okay, can I, can I just uh, say that, speak for USTR, I've known a couple of USTRs and they, get, they reach for the Panadol when the issue of India comes up, even in a bilateral context, it's always been incredibly difficult. Indonesia, very important country. South Korea, very different. Both, both Australia and the US now have bilaterals with South Korea. So can we, it's not a group, they're individual countries. So do we want to think about each three very well, pithily and quickly? Well, Korea has already said it once in on TPP. Just a question of when. So it's just yeah. a question of when. We don't have to worry about Korea. And I don't think we have to worry about Chinese Taipei because they eventually will want to come in as well. So we'll have another big economy there. Uh, Indonesia may take them a while. You know, this is supposed to be the FTAAP by the back door, and a lot of other APEC members are not going to be ready for some time to come into whatever the TPP looks like. So it may take the Indonesians a little while longer. As far as I'm concerned, India's got no business in the TPP. And I would Those not, are fighting words. And I would not, and I would <laughs> what not, about the new Modi government? Uh, well, the new Modi, can, new Modi government's got to prove that it really means business. Uh, so far, 
you know, they've talked a nice talk, but if they don't change materially the way India has behaved in recent years, and I think the fact that India is in RCEP is one reason why uh, I think RCEP doesn't really challenge the TPP in terms of quality. The Indians will ensure that it's not a high quality agreement. So, the, so Grant, um, yeah. the Indian economy obviously has really lost momentum in the last five years. The Singh government probably lost steam. Should we be giving them a handout and a leg up by involving them in something like TPP? We certainly should sit down and have a conversation with them if they're ready to do it. But I'm more with Andy in terms of uh, Modi's going to have to prove his bona fides. And he has a situation similar to what Abe did when he first came into power. He has won a very significant election. The upper house is still held by other parties. And I think until he has that consolidated, it's very difficult to have a conversation with them about the direction that he wants to take the Indian economy, but I don't think he's capable of doing right now. What, what about the U.S. view on Indonesia? How do you, how do you feel about Indonesia? Uh, Indonesia is, strikes me as a, a much more strategic question because uh, it plays into so many of the themes that play out more broadly in the security environment and the idea you have a uh, uh, really the largest Muslim country in the world. Uh, you have a country that has... Fourth largest country in the world by population, I think? No, fourth no, no, or fifth? no. Yeah, but, yeah. All right, I'm just thinking... It's a just really big of, place, yeah, it's a really right? big place. Yeah. But it, it's also what it would mean to have a moderate state in a process like this. And so my instinct is, is that if Indonesia feels like it's prepared to have that conversation, that the United States, Australia, and everybody else would see a strategic interest in trying to find a way to include them in the fold. But like everything else, politics always gets in the way, so we need the next uh, Indonesian president to be bettered down before <laughs> those discussions could be on the agenda. A any other questions for our panel? You know, trade's typically considered a sort of boring subject. I, I, I think our panelists made it less boring. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I was certainly convinced, but I'm a trade junkie. So uh, we have a, a question uh, just a little bit to my right, maybe at 1 o'clock. And John Daly will remember you. Uh, Graham Thompson. Um, a question uh, very simply. Um, why isn't there more transparency in this TPP negotiation? H having had some of the issues that, are, that, that have been exposed in the panel's discussion... These are really, really significant kinds of potential developments, yet there's very, very little discussion or transparency around them. Uh, I'm making a plea there should be more, and uh, who's stopping the transparency? It seems to me to be driven from Washington. Why? I wouldn't say it's driven by Washington. I think it's the instinct of people who are negotiators to say there has to be a place where we can have frank exchanges. I have to say, you're touching a sore point with me because I have to say, dating all the way back to my first job as a, a diplomat at the Department of State, I thought that there, in addition to the usual classification scheme of top secret, secret, SITK, clearances, things like that, there should be a stamp that said, it's just too damn embarrassing. <laughs> and that actually would cover most of the things that we classify. <laughs> and I, I really think what's at issue here is that it's just too damn embarrassing, right? And, and my, my instinct, having worked on the Hill on these issues at a time when there really was more of a demand for information, is that we're well past the point where we should be trying to be secretive about these conversations for the very reason you say. They touch on such sensitive topics, they cross a range of jurisdictions in terms of the political process, both in Australia, the United States, and everywhere else, that you have to build a consensus and build a constituency across a broad front to move one of these things politically. You can't do that unless you're putting the deal in front of people and explaining them and bringing them along as part of the process. So the irony for me is that in Washington, the truth is, is that there's a little, a little uh, publication called Inside U.S. Trade that actually owns the Xerox machine in the USDR building. <laughs> and so as soon as something is copied, it's out into the streets and publicly known. So why the charade about no transparency is really beyond me. Because your, your point is exactly the right one. There is so much on the table that it actually behooves you to be more transparent about what you're discussing and make sure that people know. Otherwise, you can't build the political constituents you have to do at the end of the day to get an agreement through so our Andrew, Congress. How, how would you grade the, the, the two Australian governments that have been dealing with TPP on this issue? 
on the issue of transparency. How, yeah, in, in bringing the public along, uh, uh, getting, getting well, people to understand the, what's on the, well, first on the of all, agenda? Well, first of all, the, I mean, the DFAT people will, will tell you, and I think this is true, that every time there's a TPP negotiation, there is an opportunity for public consultation. Yeah, you and, and I get invited, but I mean, how many times does it no, make no, it no, into but, I mean, the press? Yeah, there is an opportunity, but you, what you can't, what, the problem is you can't see the texts. And if you can't see the texts, you can't be sure what's going on. The one text that I did see from TPP was the IPR chapter that was leaked on WikiLeaks. And it was really scary because it was 124 pages long and had about 3,000 square brackets in it. So, you know... That, Let those that, lawyers loose, that, you know. I mean, that, that's, that, uh, that's what happens. You know, I think the original, the original GATT was about 98 pages. So 124 right. pages now for, you know, IPR alone is pretty scary. But I, I agree with both uh, Graham and Grant that a little bit more transparency would be useful here. I mean, I remember the, the ill-fated uh, multilateral agreement on investment exercise at the OECD. 1998. Yes. yes, which was kept too secret. And then when word got out about what was going on, all hell broke loose, and they had to drop the whole exercise. So I'd be worried that if you don't have a little bit more transparency here, you, have, you run that risk again. And I think, I think this is actually an excellent place to leave the, leave the session. Um, let me give you my, my biggest take on this issue of why these fundamentally important ones aren't the subject of a public debate the way geopolitical issues are. The answer is, I think, that, that governments believe that the only way they, the only way they can sell uh, trade agreements is more exports. And more exports because more exports means more jobs. That's what you say the second you do a trade agreement. What we've been talking about is fundamentally not about country one exporting to country two. The global economy is much more complicated than that. The issues are fundamentally important, and I think that's why sessions such as this are so important, because we can't, we can't stay in that old world that says if you run a bilateral trade deficit with somebody, that's a bad thing. Exactly right. And unfortunately, that's the way politics in almost every country in the world, every democratic country in the world runs these days. Please uh, join me in thanking our two distinguished panelists for what for me was been a fascinating session. I hope you enjoyed it.